Hello everyone, uh, I'm Paddy and today we are honored and pleased to have Dr. Furist with us. Our relation with Dr. Furist is like going back for some years now. We were honored by his presence in Alexandria School in Cairo in 2019, I think. Yeah. Yes, he gave, um, gave us three lectures about origin and uh, it was very good. And then he was generous to give us some, some of his articles we translated some of them and published in Alexandria School, the Arabic edition. So Dr. Furist is the founder and director of the Origin Research, Research Center, Munster University. He is full professor at Munster University in the Department of History, of Early Church, Patristics, and Christian Archaeology. He is the chairman of Scientific Advisory Board, Education and Religion, Göttingen University, and he is a member of the founding committee of the Board of Directors of the Center of Edition and Commentary in Munster University. Dr. Furist has had his first PhD in classical theology and then his second PhD in the history of early church and patristics. He, like his CV is like <laughs> an enormous CV, but uh, in a nutshell, he's an editor of a series called Origin Works with German translation, and another series called Admantiana, Text and Studies on Origin and His Legacy. He is the author of more than 20 books and a huge number of articles in journals and encyclopedia. I wasn't able to enumerate them. So <laughs> we are very happy to have you here, Dr. Furious, and it is always delightful for us to, to, to see you and talk with you and to listen to your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fadi, for this very kind introduction. Uh, I am really happy to be here again, at least virtually. Yes, <laughs> last visit couldn't <laughs> success because of the it's COVID. It's not a physical presence, but it's very nice to use these new technical innovations uh, for these meetings. So I have prepared for this lecture this evening a PowerPoint presentation, which I will start now. We, we agreed on the topic of Constantine the Great as, as a Roman Christian emperor. My idea is to, to explain uh, the, that the complex figure of Constantine from one side as a Roman emperor and from the other side as a Christian emperor. So because here we have the phenomenon that a Roman emperor for the first time yeah, in a way converted to Christianity. The issue about the conversion of Constantine is a very special one. Now, what is this conversion like? But anyway, he supported for the first time as emperor the Christian church in the Roman era. And it's very interesting to follow his political career, his uh, own views on, about God and Christianity, and how he treated the church, and how this changed the situation between the church and the state, the society in late antiquity, and about the consequences for the Christians and for the church in late antiquity then. Uh, I think you, or at least some of you, know basically the time where we are now. We are at the beginning of the fourth century. Um, Constantine started his political career in 306. Um, we need to grasp the starting point to understand what he did, why he was successful, and uh, how he himself uh, understood this successful career. The starting point is at this time that there is not only one emperor in the Roman Empire. Before we had another famous emperor, Diocletian. Oh, I forgot to write him here. But, so Diocletian, uh, reorganized the system of uh, political power by introducing the so-called tetrarchy. 
So there was one Augustus and one Caesar in both the eastern and western part of the Roman Empire. The empire was so big, and it was under pressure from German tribes, <laughs> or Gothic tribes, <laughs> uh, coming over the Rhine or the Danube to invade the Roman Empire, simply to find a better life there. They, their intention was not to destroy the empire, but to be part of it. So to uh, have the life there. And there was a constant trouble uh, in the eastern parts with the Persian Empire. Uh, and so all of these difficulties were too much to handle for one emperor. And so Diocletian introduced this system that there were two emperors called Augustus uh, as a title, not as a name. And both had one, so to say, sub-emperor called a Caesar. And this was the system in, uh, at the beginning of the fourth century. The father of Constantine, Constantius Chlorus, was one of the Augusti in the Western parts. And when he died in 306, uh, his son, Constantine, uh, should become Caesar in the Western part as his successor. But the soldiers, the, the legions in, in York, in Britain, so right in the north of uh, Britain, they proclaimed him as Augustus. This was, in political terms, a kind of usurpation because there was an Augustus in the west part of this Roman Empire. He's, he was called Maxentius. And so uh, there was a rivalry now in the western part of the Roman Empire, so in Britain, in Gaul, Spain, Italy, and Northern Africa, uh, between Constantine and Maxentius. And in this rivalry, uh, Constantine, um, triumphed over Maxentius in a very famous battle and a famous victory over Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge near Rome. This is a, a, a bridge uh, over the Tiber, the Tiber, in the north, north of Rome, called the Milvian Bridge. It was by chance that the battle was there. Uh, the troops of Maxentius were much stronger than the troops of Constantine. And all advantages were at the side of Maxentius. But against all what people could expect, Constantine was victorious. It was 28th of October, 312. And we will come back to this because Constantine constantly during his lifetime later ascribed his victory to the Christian God. And this, was, this is a very important uh, step in his career and in his move to support Christianity. Uh, before we come back to that, I simply mention the, the main political uh, aspects of this development. The Augustus in the eastern part, in those days, was Licinius. He had uh, he has besieged or besieged here. He won uh, the battle over his Caesar in the eastern part, and then he was the sole emperor in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Constantine, after his victory over Maxentius, was the Augustus in the western part. And they both met in Milan, in northern Italy, in 313, to discuss how to rule the empire together. Um, and they made an agreement, and they agreed about many aspects of this a common rule, and one important aspect was that they decided in a way to tolerate 
the Christian religion. And this is a uh, and this agreement uh, has become a kind of date for the Constantinian turn, because here for the first time two Roman emperors agreed that the Christians in the whole Roman Empire should be able, again after the Diocletian persecution, to meet in the churches, to have their religious life, and so on. So for this, this agreement of 313 became the, the date for this. Um, Constantine and Licinius, however, were rivals. Both of them wanted to become the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. And so they started uh, war against each other. And the end of this was in, two, in, in 324. Uh, Constantine was successful again. He won over Licinius in a final battle. Uh, and the outcome was that Constantine was the sole ruler in the Roman Empire again. So in the political terms, this was the end of the Tetrarchy. From then on, there was again one empire. Uh, this lasted in the Constantinian dynasty until 363 and some years later. Uh, then political system changed again, and there were most of the time two empires, and then started the process of the breaking away of the eastern and western parts of the empire. But this is already one 200 years after Constantine. Constantine uh, thus ruled the Roman Empire until 336. 37 when he died, and so was Augustus starting in 306 for more than 30 years. This is quite long for a Roman emperor, so most of them didn't manage to live that long. Many of them in the third century died on the battlefield, some were murdered, so this was a very long uh, emperorship, and he used it really to to change this empire in a Christian way. The most important question is why he did this. It's not unusual that a Roman empire, a Roman emperor favored one god. So actually every emperor did this, but usually they choose a pagan god uh, to build or to to build in an ideological way their, their, the Roman Empire on it. So Di Diocletian, for instance, favored Hercules, or Heracles in Greek. And then he, he favored this god and the temples and so on. All other cults were going on as well. So Constantine was the first who chose the Christian god to... Uh, as the religious foundation for his uh, rulership. And as I said, he himself ascribed this to the battle in 312. He himself later told, as uh, Eusebius of Caesarea and Lactantius, uh, a Latin church father, and Eusebius, a Greek bishop in Caesarea and famous church father, uh, they, they say what, that uh, Constantine himself told them about visions and auditions he had before this battle. Their uh, reports are not fully identical, but when we put them together in a way, then Constantine told them that he had a dream uh, in the night that he should put the sign of the sun and cross on the shields of his soldiers. And Eusebius describes it 
that he had a vision as well uh, at the day, together with the whole army, that he saw the sign of a cross above the sun. We can speculate now what they saw or, or what it is. Uh, at least this was Constantine's uh, explanation of what he did. So he put the sign of the sun and the cross at the shields of his soldiers and at the standards of his army. And as Eusebius and Lactantius describe it, it's in Greek letters, a very, which became a very famous sign then. Uh, these are, you can see the first, here you can see it better, the first two letters of the Greek word Christos. It's a Greek he and a Greek ro. And if you put it together, you have this, and this became later on the most important sign for Christos, the so-called Staurogram or Christogram, or because you can explain the text in a different way, that it's a he turned around a little bit and then to a ro, and then you have this sign. So you, you can imagine different ways of this sign, and we have uh, this sign in different ways in, on coins and other material uh, reliques from this time. So this was the sign of Christ. And it was for Constantine, as he described it, a combination of sun and cross. And this is very interesting. Because when Constantine grew up, he already worshipped the sun. The cult of the sun, or as the Romans called it in Latin, Sol Invictus, the invincible sun god, this god Sol Invictus has become more and more important during the third century. We know it from many altars and temples and so on. One emperor before uh, Constantine, um, Aurelian, he built his rulership on the sun god, and so on. And Constantine's father, Constantius Chlorus, was also an adherent of the Sol Invictus. And this cult of Sol Invictus, which became more and more important, uh, developed in a way that you can say this was in a way in the direction of a monotheistic cult, so that this Sol Invictus was worshipped as if he were the only god. That was actually not the case in the Roman Empire. Now we still had many cults and this polytheistic system, but the sun god attracted more and more cults so that many other gods were identified with the sun and other gods were uh, seen as modes of the sun god or as kinds of his how how he appears in different uh, uh, how to say different shapes and so on so this was uh, in a way uh, a direction to a monotheistic cult and we can see traces that constantine in a way, when he turned to the Christian God, identified the Sol Invictus with the Christian God. So that he, he had the impression that uh, what he already knew and what he worshipped from the beginning is actually the Christian God. And you can see this in, in these visions and additions which were described by Lucretius, uh, Lactantius and Eusebius, that he had a vision of the sun and the cross combined together. Um, and we can see this in some other traits of his imperial self-representation. 
Um, you may know, or you may have seen already this. I will show you some pictures now. Um, when Constantine won the battle against Maxentius in 312, he moved uh, to Rome from, he was in Gaul before, he was in, in a German city today, Trier, Augusta Trevororum, that was the capital of uh, uh, Augustus in, in Gaul. He moved to Rome. Um, he went, he had a triumph, like Roman emperors used to have it after a big victory. So he had a triumph uh, entrance into, into Rome from the Colosseum. You can see the Colosseum here. Uh, here on the left side is the Forum Romanum. So usually you start here and from the Forum Romanum to go left to the capital and then to the uh, Imperial Palace on the Palatine. Uh, when Constantine entered Rome after the siege, he did one remarkable thing. Usually an emperor went to the capital. There were, he, he sacrificed there to the Roman gods, to Jupiter uh, and the Capitoline Trias, and then he went to the imperial palace. Constantine did not go to the capital. He entered the Roman Forum, and then he turned left before the capital and immediately entered the, his palace on the Palatine. Not to sacrifice the god was a specific Christian habit. This was the Christian habit because of which they got trouble with the Roman state before, and there were persecutions and so on. So by doing this, Constantine made clear to all the people there that he is no longer doing sacrifice to the pagan gods. And these people in Rome and were not, a, not at all Christians yet. So Christians were still a minority. So modern calculations tend to 10, 50%. So, and especially in Rome, in the center, most people are pagans. So, but all people must have realized then that he is turning to Christianity. The Senate in Rome did what he did with some emperors. They uh, built uh, an arch, a triumph arch. Uh, and this arch of Constantine, which was finished in 315 for this victory over Maxentius in 312, is still there. You can see it here in Rome before the Colosseum standing here. The modern uh, traffic is now going around this, <laughs> this arch, no? but in <laughs> In ancient Rome, it was a road here you go through. And in this arch, you have symbols of Roman history and so on. So now, this is very interesting. Um, on this arch, built up by the Roman Senate and the city of Rome for this victory of Constantine, there is no Christian symbol. So they... They simply thought in lines of pagan Roman history. There is the sun god there. I will come back to this later because it's interesting with the imagery of Constantine. Uh, but there is an inscription. You cannot, I will show you this inscription soon. It was here and on the other side. So when you uh, cross this arch from each side, you can see this inscription. And in this inscription, the, it's explained why they set up this arch. And it reads as following, uh, that's only an explanation. Now in Arco Constantini nobilissimo qui es propria amphitheatrum Flavium. So in, in the Arch of Constantine near the 
Amphitheatrum Flavium, the Flavish Amphitheater, that's the Colosseum. You have in Utraque Facia on both sides. And now that's the text of the inscription. It's Imperator Caesar uh, Filio Constantino Maximo Pius or Pio Felici Augusto. So for the Emperor Caesar Constantine the Great, or the greatest, because he has won now, he's Pius, he is he's showing piety, he's pious, he's Felix, he's lucky, so he, or whether he, uh, the, the grace of the gods is on him, he's Augustus, then you have the acronym SPQR, Senatus Populus Romanus, so Senate and people of Rome, they, the verb is at the end, they decade it. They dedicated this arch to the Emperor Constantine. Quote, because instinctu divinitatis mentis magnitudine cum exercitu suo, tam de tyranno quam de omni eius factione, uno tempore justis republicam ultus est armis arcum triumphis insignem. So they dedicated this arch of triumph because by the instincts of the deity, driven by a deity, uh, because of the greatness magnitudo of his um, means, of his thoughts, with his army, cum executus suo, he rescued the, the people from the tyrant. The tyrant is Maxentius. He is now called a tyrant because he lost. No? Um, uno tempore. Uh, and the tyrant and his faction, so his uh, followers, he rescued by used his army by right arms, so his, his case was a right case, and he rescued the state, Republica. So you see the typical political language here. No? The loser is the tyrant, the winner is the great imperator now, of course, and he rescued the city and the people of Rome and so on. And the interesting thing is that they say he did it yeah, by the, how to say, divinity instinct to a kind of, uh, it was a kind of revelation of the divinity to him that he should do that. So it, this was driven by, a, by God. But they avoid, no, it's the Senate who wrote this text. The Senate is still a pagan Senate, not a Christian one. But they avoid to name a pagan deity here because they knew the new Christian identity of Constantine. And they did not write this text before asking him before whether this text is okay or not, of course. So, and they write in an open way, divinitas. It's a deity. So everyone can imagine what deity is meant. And it's in the singular. It's not a pagan plural that the gods did this, but the deity did it. And this is in a kind typical for the early Constantine that he uh, tried to set up a language by which Christians and pagans could be comfortable. Christians can say this deity is the Christian God. A pagan uh, adherer of Sol Invictus could say this is the invincible son who did that and so on. So it's a kind of open language for this transition uh, Constantine wanted to set up. Let's go to another thing. When I'm 
Roman emperor started his emperorship, uh, he usually emitted coins with his own image. And these coins uh, were programmatic. You have to imagine ancient circumstances, <laughs> no internet, <laughs> no, uh, no Twitter, no Facebook, or even before, no newspapers uh, and so on, no modern mass, mass media, how we call it. So how do people get to know what's going on in the center of Rome, in this vast empire from Britain to Egypt, from, from Spain and Morocco to, to Turkey and so on? Uh, of course, there were uh, people traveling around and so on. There were messages, oral news and so on. But a very important thing was to emit coins. Because on these coins, an emperor uh, tried to convey his understanding how he wants to rule to the people. And we go to the left side first. This is a silver coin uh, from Italy. Uh, from the year two, oh, I have to check it now, 215, sorry, I should know that. Yes, from 315, the same time as the Arch of Constantine. And uh, there were 10,000s of this coin, of course. We have, we have three of them. And this is the first coin of the Roman emperor where we can see a Christian image or a Christian pic, uh, emblem on it. You have, it's very conventional, actually. No, it's Constantine as a soldier, now with a helmet and on a horse. He's wearing a shield. You can see here on the shield, it's the Roman wolf or the, what's the English female, a female wolf, a she-wolf with the, twi the twins, Romulus and Remus. So that's the, the, the traditional uh, emblem for a Roman emperor. That's the sign of this Rome. Um, and he is a victorious emperor over his enemies. And then here you have the so-called labarum, which is the standard of the Roman army. If you want, you can interpret it as the sun and the cross. So the vision Constantine had at the battle in 312. Uh, on the other side, this is very traditional again. So there were standards in the Roman army like this before, because the sun god was an important god for the soldiers before. So this is not necessarily a Christian sign. You can interpret it as the Christian sign and cross. But typically Christian is what you can see here. If you can see it, it's very small. But in front of his helmet, so on his face, above his face, you have the Christogram here for the first time. What I... What you can see here, this sign for, Christ, for the first two letters of the name of Christ are here in this coin. So here for the first time, we have a Christian, we have a Roman emperor in the traditional Roman imagery with a Christian and clearly Christian sign on this coin as well. I have put this coin uh, to this. This is a gold coin from the same uh, times. I have to check it's, is it later? No, it's, it's quite the same time. It's much bigger, though this is the real size of these things in, in relation to each other. It's not from silver, it's from gold. Uh, and we have a lot of, and there are a lot of these coins as well. 
we have again Constantine, but now not without a Christian image. But he now is the twin of the sun god. Here you have the sun god. You always can see the rays of the sun here uh, on his head. This is image of the sun god. The, we have two heads quite similar, actually the same, <laughs> coming out of one body, so to say. Here the emperor with a kind of victorial band around his head and the sun god here. And on the shield, which he is wearing here, you have the, the sun god and his four horses uh, as he was depicted when he's riding over the, over the sky and shining over, over the world. So what we have in Constantine is again this a parallel idea that it's the sun god and it's the Christian god and which he conflated in a way uh, and under whom he reigned the Roman Empire. Another interesting image is this. You know, Constantine built a new city. We, I will come back to this. Um, Constantinople. He built a new Rome as a Christian Rome. And in this new Rome, he only built churches, uh, explicitly as the turn away from the pagan Rome to the new Christian Rome in Constantinople, named after himself. And from 330 on, he reigned in Constantinople. But in the mid of this town, there was a big uh, column, which is now destroyed. We only have the base. It was destroyed in the 12th century by a storm, simply. But we have an image in an old map from the 4th century. Uh, and this is a drawing of this map, where the image of the state of the polis of Constantinople um, was built up and this column and uh, at the top of this column, you have the sun god wearing or, or holding the, the world in his hand and a scepter. So again, in his Christian city, he had a column and on the top of the column, an image of the sun god. And the last very interesting thing is this one. Um, this is from the Arch of Constantine, again in Rome. Uh, there is a picture, the eastern side, and this is, again, the soul. The soul Invictus riding on his four horses over the world uh, between Earth, here the, that's the a god of... of uh, of a river, maybe a river god and the god of heaven. And he is riding there over the, over the earth. On the left, on the right side, you see again a coin. When a Roman emperor died, uh, he was deified. He was consecrated among the stars in the heaven, like gods. The first who, uh, who had this fate, so to say, this posthumous fate was Caesar. So as a deified god, so to say. When Constantine died, he, they, they coined, uh, uh, the people, of course, not he himself, but he had arranged it before, People emitted coins, consecration coins of Constantine, where he himself, Constantine, is presented like the Son of God, like the Sol Invictus, in a, with four horses and his wagon there, moving up to heaven. And now here you have a Christian sign. A hand is coming out of heaven, and now you can 
think to whom this hand belongs, but I think it's quite clear that the hand of God is omnipresent, for instance, in the Bible. Now, this is the hand of the Christian God coming out of the heaven, and Constantine has his own hand, and so God will take him and draw him up in, into heaven. So he used the old, the traditional imagery to give a new Christian idea to it. So that's a, what we have in his own representation, how he himself presented uh, himself to the people. Uh, and you see the, the old traditional uh, images are very strong still, but he put, he put into this old images Christian signs that he is turning this now to Christianity. And we can think now what his uh, own idea about God was. I think he really had the idea that the Christian God is the Son God. Or the sun god is the Christian god, however you do it. So I have to <laughs> look at the clock now for the time. So anyway, what Constantine did on this basis is that he really favored the Christians. Um, the idea behind is, in uh, again a traditional idea that the stability and prosperity of the empire is based on the worship of God. And thus, one of the main duties of the emperor is to uh, stabilize, to favor the cultic worship of God, to do all so that the cult can go on. For the first time, Constantinus Pontifex, or let me put it this way. The emperor, in this sense, in Roman times, is the Pontifex Maximus. He is the supreme priest, and he has to fund the temples, the priesthoods, and so on, so that this cultic worship of God is going on, because it's the basis for uh, the Roman Empire. Constantine himself understood himself as Pontifex Maximus. He still called, was called Pontifex Maximus. Only an emperor later, Theodosius, uh, resigned to this title. Uh, um, and in this role, Constantine did the following in, in chronological order. The Christian clerics did not have to pay taxes for from then on. They should be free to fulfill uh, their religious duties, and so they were exempted from fulfilling public duties. This was very important because uh, rich people had to fulfill public duties in, the, in those days. Uh, there was no uh, state organization for many things. People had to do that. Uh, and they had to pay, and they had to pay taxes. So they had to use their own wealth to do that. But clerics, bishops were exempted from that, which made bishopric very attractive for many people on the other side, no? because then they could use their money in other ways. <laughs> um, then another important thing is uh, the civil jurisdiction of bishops, the so-called Audiencia Episcopalis in 318. Uh, Constantine uh, made a law that people can uh, go to the bishops with their, uh, you know, when they had problems with law affairs and, and so on. Uh, when Christians were involved, they could do that before bishops. And this became very prominent, and people used it very often, so that uh, many bishops in 4th and 5th century uh, really suffered by this. No? They spent the whole day, or the half of their day, with uh, in, in courts <laughs> with 
people about their uh, matters there. This meant that bishops now were treated like state officials and they became the same role and the same uh, habits of how they were treated and, and, and so on. Uh, this was a big change when you think that not 10 years before bishops went to jail in, in the Christian persecutions. Now they got the rank of state officials. A very important law was in 321, Constantine declared that, now interesting, the Dies Solis, the day of the sun god, the Sunday in English, in German as well, Sonntag, uh, became a feast day for the whole Roman Empire, for all people. So he, that's a reorganization of the calendar of the Roman Empire, which was ordered before along the Roman gods and feasts in a, in a mixed way of free day and working days. And now he established that every Sunday there should be no work except people, um, agriculture and so on. So there were some exemptions. Uh, and basically, he introduced what uh, we have in Christian countries until today, this seven week with Sunday as a holy day without work. So this is a very big change. And everyone in the Roman Empire realized this in his day-to-day -day life. Huh? Of course. I already mentioned the consecration of Constantinople as Christian New Rome. Um, this is the biggest uh, building project of Constantine. He started as well building big churches in many cities of the Roman Empire. And again, some pictures. The first we know, and which is still uh, we exist still today, is the Basilica of Aquileia in the northern Italy. It's north of Venice, the northern part of the Adria, a, a, an important harbor in Roman times. Um, and this Basilica of Aquileia uh, in basically is still there from the first uh, years, you see, 314 to 320, from the first year of Augustine's rulership in the western parts of the Roman Empire. Uh, that's the interior of this basilica. So you can imagine, really, it, it, it still looks like it looked in the early 4th century, so one of the oldest buildings we have in Christian churches. Um, this three... Uh, where all these two columns and here in the apsis were the service going on, people in it, a very nice floor with ancient pictures on it, a uh, fish or flowers and so on. It's, it's still preserved. Uh, it was excavated. Now you see a bit beneath these columns. Um, uh, like here, these yeah, young people, children actually fishing uh, in, in boats. Uh, this is traditional imagery again, but the fish is a symbol of Christianity. So again, they use Im images known to all people, but now interpreted in a Christian way. Another church, which is no longer standing in this way, was St. Peter on the Vatican Hill in Rome, which is still now St. Peter. But what we have now in Rome, the Dome of Peter is a, a Renaissance building. Uh, uh, the old building was set up, started by Constant Constantine. And we only have a picture of this older one. It looks like this. Oh, it looked like this. Uh, it was really destroyed. They destroyed it beginning of the 16th century and built this new famous 
uh, dome of St. Peter with the uh, cupola of uh, Michelangelo. Uh, but the earlier building was from Constantine. It's the same with St. Paul, St. Paul of Uri Le Mure in Rome. St. Paul is still there, an old picture. So really big, big churches, which were never set up before in the Roman Empire. Let's go to Jerusalem. Um, this is an ancient map, which was found in Madaba. It's in Jordani, Jordan today, Madaba, northern of Jordan. They find in the floor a map for pilgrims of the Holy Land. And on this map, you see Jerusalem. The northern part is here. This is the gate to Damascus to the north. And then you have the main street of Jerusalem in the fourth century, the Cardo, the Roman Cardo. And on this side you have, uh, is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So the, it's... You have to turn your head right and move down here, and then it's down, and here's the top of the church. So on this map, we already have this church, which was set up by Constantine. That's a modern picture. That's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Here now the small place where you, where you enter it. And down here is uh, this building, now here you have the sepulchre with a small chapel around it and a bigger, and then several churches. I think the Coptic churches have to go down here for, for the Coptic church. Uh, and there are some ideas how the original first Constantinian building looked like. Maybe like this, that's a model of that he already had this, the entrance where it still is, and that we have these basic structure uh, and down here the, the sepulchre. So Constantine built this church in uh, Jerusalem and also the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. That's the, when you enter from the western side, the church is behind here. It looks like a fortress now because they <laughs> used it later on in Crusader times. They uh, changed the wall like into a fortress, uh, but actually here is the small entrance. So here you enter the church, you have to bow. It's very, <laughs> it's very small today to go into this church. And then you have this, that's the church in, in Bethlehem, the, uh, here the floor is open because down here you have old mosaics from late antiquity. Uh, in front of it is, uh, let's go down, uh, the, the Grotto of Nativity. Uh, here, the Star of Bethlehem. And now I go back. And in the church here on this side, you have later put on it, so these parts are later built and rebuilt again, of course. Um, you have very nice mosaics where the four ecumenical councils are there and the texts and the creeds of Nicaea, Constantinople, and, and Chalcedon, and so on. Uh, they found them behind the later uh, walls. So what you have, two last pictures. Uh, because looking for what do we have from originally, this is again in, in Carado, northern Italy, near Aquileia, uh, an old church from the 6th century, not Constantinian times, but a bit later. But you see the same like Aquileia, the same structure, the same kind of floor. And there is a comparable church in Porich, in Croatia, from the 6th century, built in the same in the same way, pictures like this. Uh, okay, so what is he doing? You can imagine um, an ancient city and in ancient Roman pagan times, there is, can, can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, it's good still, okay. Uh, in ancient Roman times, you have the 
temples of the ancient gods at the main places. They dominate, so to say, uh, the city. And now Constantine starts changing this. Now he is building big cities, big churches in these cities. Of course, he is doing it in Constantinople, in a new Christian city. He is doing it in cities which are important for Christianity, Jerusalem, Bethlehem. But he's doing it in Rome as well. He's doing it in Antioch, for instance. So he creates a, a new public image of the church. So Christians are in uh, are present now, and you can see them in, in the cities. This does not mean that he immediately abolished uh, the pagan cults. Constantine actually was quite tolerant. So there is already preserved a written sentence from him uh, that everyone should worship the God he wants to do. So he favored the Christian cult and he, he, he did many things, as you see, to, to propagate it and people were, were converted to Christianity. But with a few exemptions, uh, Constantine was not violent against pagan cults and so on. This was only to jump at the end of the fourth century, the religious policy of Theodosius I. He is the second important emperor for the Constantinian era, the end, 379 to 395. Uh, he, for the first time in 380, uh, promulgated an edict, so a law, uh, called Cumptus Populus, after the first words. And in this law, he proclaimed Christianity as state religion of the Roman Empire. This was not yet done by Constantine, but now at the end of the fourth century, Christians had become a ma the majority. Uh, pagan cults and so on were declining more and more. And now this emperor made a law that Christianity has to be the religion of the Roman Empire. And he went even further, 10 years later, roughly 391, 10, um, he made laws against pagan cult practices. Some, the sons of Constantine had done this before, but they were not very successful, but they didn't enforce it. But now, Theodosius enforced this, these laws, so he now uh, actively closed temples, he forbade sacrifices at temples, and so on. And this was the beginning of the end of pagan cults in uh, this now Christian Roman Empire. And until the fourth century, they were all gone. Now, and you can see today all these cults like Jupiter, Zeus, or Minerva, Athene, they are only uh, yeah, things from ancient times, but no longer active in this way. So I think I, had, I have used up my time. I do not do this now. Um, or maybe I use, I only say some and then we can have some question and discussions. Um, it, it's a very interesting transition uh, with Constantine the Great here. He clearly favored the Christians. He took many steps to bolster the Christian church uh, and so on. Uh, and of course, this was an advantage for the church. And the bishops, more or less, they all welcomed this development. And I can understand this very clearly if you can imagine that immediately before Constantine, we had a very heavy uh, persecution and the Diocletian, um, many Christians suffered, many died. Uh, and now they had to face an emperor which was friendly to them. He, he, uh, they were invited to the, to the court and, and so on, and they 
became more and more important figures in his empire. So, of course, they were happy with this development. On the other side, it was not only an advantage for the church. Because uh, the main problem is that Constantine, as a Roman empire, had a very clear idea about the function of the church and about the, the duty of the church in his empire. No? The Christian worship should stabilize the empire. That's the idea he had. And in this way, he made his religious and church politics. The bishops and the churchmen on the other side, they were surprised. They didn't expect this. Now, if you read texts from the third century, for instance, Origen, which was already mentioned, you, you can see it clearly in his texts. They had not the slightest idea that the emperor could become a Christian. This was not what they expected in the near future. So they were surprised and they had no theory or no idea how to deal with this new situation. And this is why we have controversies, the Donatist controversy in the West, the Aryan controversy in the East, and then in the whole empire, where there were problems in the church. Actually, they were schismas or heresies, like the Donatists in the West, like the Aryans in the, West, in the East. And it was actually a problem in the church, either a problem of more of church order, like in the Donatist controversy, or a dogmatic problem, like in the Aryan controversy about, the, about God and the Trinity. But for Constantine, it was a, prob a problem which he could not ignore, because his idea was that the church uh, was part of or that the church was a unifying element in the Roman Empire. And now he has problems in the church and heavy controversies. So he had to deal with this problem. And basically what he did is that he called synods or councils, uh, the first in Arl, 314 for the Donatist controversy, the second in Nicaea, you all know that, I think, uh, what later became then, or what was uh, as accepted by all churches as the first ecumenical council in 325, he organized these councils so that the, bish the bishops should settle uh, their struggle. And actually, he forced them to do that, and they did it. But it was always an ongoing conflict that the emperor was mainly interested in the unity of the church as part of the unity of the empire. And the bishops were all also interested in the unity of the church. But first, they were interested in the right dogma, in the right creed. And actually, the emperor had a policy that he says, Unity has to come first, and you have to arrange your dogma in the second step. And thus, sons of Constantine favored the Arians, for instance, because they were the majority in the middle of the fourth century. And the bishops, or most of the bishops, like uh, famous Athanasius, of course, of Alexandria, they said, yeah, unity is very important, but first is that we have the right creed and the right idea about God. And if you agree on that, we can have unity. And this is the ongoing conflict in late antiquity between emperor and church, uh, which ended up in different solutions, uh, changing constellations, the emperor favored one or the other side, um, and actually different ideas about the relationship about state and church. But I think I leave it on this now. So many, many thanks uh, for your patience.
to hear my long lecture about one hour, 60 minutes in the, in the evening. Uh, I see already some questions here. Um, so first, Fadi, how should we proceed? Yes, we, you can read the question or I can read the questions and you, you just choose the question you want to answer to or you go through all of them. It's up to you. Okay. Uh, so maybe I just take these questions out how they are here. Uh, and some questions are easier to answer and some will take more time. So when I see here, did he found any resistance when convert to Christianity? No, not at all. No, they welcomed him as a Christian, if you mean, if this is meant. Um, so only later on, some Christians complained about what he did with the church, but this was very rare. No? So there was no resistance. Did King Constantine convert to Arianism? That's an interesting question. <laughs> I would say no, he did not convert to Arianism. No, but the, the development was complicated. No, as, as I said, this explanation that he identified the son of God, uh, sorry, the sun God, <laughs> uh, so the, the soul in victory with the Christian God, Constantine was not baptized until a few days before his death. And this has always been my question to that. How can you be a Christian without being baptized? That's what makes a Christian. So Christian uh, Constantine did not do that. If you're not baptized, you can actually not participate in the Eucharist. So Constantine never participated in a Eucharist at a Sunday worship, so to say, because he was baptized only at the end of his life. Now, the problem of your question is, when he was baptized, he was baptized by an Arian. <laughs> so <laughs> he was, in this sense, uh, he was an Arian baptized Christian, but this does not mean so much for his life, so, so to say. Um, and this has to do that shortly after the Council of Nicaea, he realized that many, many people thought like Arius, the Arians were in the majority then in the East. Uh, and so he, he changed his attitude and he allowed all these Aryan bishops to be bishops, uh, and actually he supported the Aryans then. The problem is, and we have a letter of him quoted by Eusebius, that he did not really realize the, the problem behind that. So for him, it was a minor problem how you think about God and his son and so on. For him, it was not that important. So he did not realize that this was very important for the Christians and that this is one of the most important questions in Christianity. And so I think for him, it, it was not that big. And so for him, it was not a big question whether he was baptized shortly, uh, still lying in his bed to die by an Aaron bishop or by a, by a Nicene bishop. Uh, to explain this a bit, this was a very common habit in the fourth century. People uh, postponed or delayed their baptism because uh, the idea was that baptism is a very important step. If you were baptized, you really have to take seriously to live a Christian life now. And many people said that that's that's too uh, ambitious for me. I, 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 I know myself, I'm, I, will have, I will be a sinner again, and so on. So many people did this um, with the idea that baptism is the forgiveness of all sins. So if you are baptized when you die, you, you go to heaven without any 
<laughs> without any sin. <laughs> we have many, many homilies from bishops who preached against this habit. No? They urged people to, to get baptized earlier, but it was very common in the fourth century, and actually Constantine did the same. So that was this habit. So this to this question, is the Feast of the Sun of December, which became Christmas Day? Yes, actually, that's, that's it. That's a, that's a Roman Feast Day of the Sunday. And we have, uh, you know, Christmas is not the oldest feast in Christianity. No, it's, it's Easter and, and there are different customs. But we have the first uh, mention of this in the middle of the 4th century in Rome, 352. There is a calendar. And here we have, for the first time, uh, that on this day of uh, the sun god, uh, Christians celebrated the birth of the true son, the son of justice, uh, of, of this Bible text. Uh, and they've had for the first Christmas on this day, and then it spread quite quickly to the Greek-speaking Eastern parts. I have to confess, I know it's a bit different in Coptic Church uh, because of calendar, and it's not uh, Christmas birthday, it's presentation in the temple, and it's a different way of handling it. But it has to do with this, and you again see this sun, God, and Christian God combination. So it's, I, I have to check. But he was baptized with an illegal baptism. Did that mean that he's not a convert to Arius, or do we consider him a Christian? I, I, I propose to consider him a Christian because he always understood himself as a Christian. And he always supported the Christian churches and, and, and so on, and the bishops. He had a Christian politics in the, in the Roman Empire, clearly. Uh, the problem is, what, what is a Christian? No, I, I think he had a very special idea of Christianity, uh, and which is not necessarily our idea about Christianity. Um, so I go back to the first question. Did Constantine choose Christianity as a lone religion or as Jesus' is God among the gods of the empire? Empire Colossian? Empire Colossian? I don't understand the last one, but uh, no, no, he did not. That's, that's a good question. He did not understand Jesus as one God among many other gods. This, this would be to turn Christ, Jesus into a pagan God, so to say. No, he clearly had the idea that there is one God, and this one God is the Christian God, and this Christian God is the same as the Son God. That's the way I would... I would put it, and not only me, many do. Many see it this way. If you take the texts and these images together, how to how to understand how to understand this? So he he was clearly had clearly the idea of a monotheistic Christian God to worship. He did not enforce, as I said, all pagans now immediately to do that. No, he was. We have some letters of him quoted by Eusebius that he was convinced that this, the Christian God is so powerful, so to say, that all people will be convinced by him earlier or later. So that was his idea about that. So in this sense, he had a strong belief. Then one question, did the vision appear to him? Was very obvious to convert to Christianity because of it very soon? Yeah, the... <laughs> The, the problem of this vision is we only know it from Lactantius and Eusebius in later texts. And both, both say, or, or both write what Constantine told them. So actually, we only know what Constantine himself thought about that. And then the next point is, this is not an exemption 
for Roman emperors. Actually, every Roman emperor told that he had a vision, that a god told him what to do. And they, of course, they liked to tell stories like these when they were successful. No, when they were successful, they said, oh, there was a God behind me and that's why I was successful. So in, in this tradition, Constantine did the same and he did it with a Christian God for the first time. That's the specific thing with him. Um, so I would, not, I would not put too much on this. The... The mystery, for me, it remains a mystery why he really uh, chose Christianity and the Christian God as his favorite God and his favorite religion. So, and I would not put it on this vision, but I would say somehow he must have been convinced by what they saw, what Christians did. And uh, maybe as a politician, he was a very... Uh, a very good ruler in this sense, uh, he, he might have seen some advantage in the Christian church for his politics. But this is only the outer side. I think there is an inner side uh, why he did this for, in a way of a conviction, which we cannot really grasp because it, it's written nowhere. No, we only have these official texts and documents and all the pictures I showed to you are a kind of, uh, yeah, it's advertising his, his politics. No? Uh, did you find it? I had this, I had this. No. Did he support Christianity for the peace of the empire or for the faith itself and Christians in the Roman Empire? I, I would say for the first one. Um, I think he uh, he really had this political idea. Maybe to explain another thing, which is different, but now there are more cultural differences in there. It is at least different when you think about a separation from faith and politics from religion and politics. There is no separation of religion, religion and politics in antiquity. It's even wrong, I would say, to speak of separation, because when you think of separation or differentiation, you only have the idea that there are two things which you can separate or which you can put together. I think in all antiquity and also in Christian antiquity, there are there is an idea that this is actually the same, or the two sides of the same thing. The idea behind it is very old. You have it in old Egypt, you have it in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you have it even in Paul, Romans, letter to the Romans, chapter 13. What is, an, what is a king? What is an emperor? An emperor is... Um, a kind of uh, human god which is and his duty is to put order and justice onto the world. That's actually the idea of rulership in a good sense in antiquity. And this duty is a religious duty. So like God is the ruler of the whole world and the gods are now, now, the gods of God is the same idea here. Uh, they are the ones who create the world. They put order into the world. And to this order belongs justice to all people. And the emperor's duty is to make sure that this is done in the states. And if he's doing this, he's a good emperor. And if he's not doing this, he's a bad emperor. And if he's not doing this, you can criticize him as the prophets did in uh, in old Israel, uh, and so on. So this, this is the idea of, or this is a religious idea of kingship, so to say. And I'm quite sure that Constantine had the same idea. 
So for him, it's not uh, on the one side, there is a religion and there is faith and uh, there are worshippers of this God. And on the other side, there is a state and there are politics. But for him, it's the idea that people have to worship at least one God to fit into this order of the world. So I think the most strange idea for ancient people was to have no God. Because this is out of every world order they could imagine. Um, and in this sense, for, uh, for Constantine, it was part of his role as emperor to create peace. And one aspect of peace is to, or to establish an order of peace. And one aspect is uh, to have a worship to the right or to the biggest God. So, and for him, this was the Christian God. And on the other side, I think that, that most people in those days thought on the same lines and the bishops had the same ideas about that. And that's why we're happy with that. No? Uh, the, the problems came on the second step when they realized, uh, now we have in our faith, faith some ideas which do not always fit with, this, uh, with these old ideas. <laughs> and then it creates new conflicts. Um, um, I skipped one question. I think Eusebius here, Christine. Eusebius never mentioned finding the crew cross. Yeah. But uh, he mentioned building church. What is your, about this matter? Yeah, this finding of the crew cross is a later, is a later legend, so to say. Um, it, it, it's combined with his mother, Helena, uh, which went to uh, to Jerusalem and so on. But this is a later story to explain this. Uh, I, I think um, we have signs for, for the place of the sepulchre. And the sign they identified there, and it could be the right place. I, I think so. It, it's archaeologically, it's different. It's difficult, no? but there are some hints that it's it might be the right place. And he built the church on that to show this new importance of the church. So that's the uh, the main motive to do that, and that's why he did it on many other places as well. No? Always on these kinds of uh, where where they at least had the idea that there is a sepulchre of Peter and Paul in Rome. Uh, they did not have it in Constantinople. So, you know, and so they transferred the, uh, St. Andrew to, uh, to Constantinople to have this uh, tradition as well there. Um, so I think it's a kind of imperial representation of the church. Uh, I have not shown you a picture of uh, the first basilica. Now we call them basilica. It's uh, Basilois. It's the emperor. It's an imperial building because the original building behind it was an, imper an imperial hall uh, like Constantine built in Trier in Augusta Trevororum in his capital in, uh, in Gaul. And this Constantine Basilica, which, which was not a church, it was his imperial hall, is still standing today. It's a church now. No? Later it was turned into a church. Into a church. But it's, it's the same building like you have seen on my pictures for these uh, Constantinian basilicas built along these, these lines. So did I skip any question now? Was it? No, I 
talked too much. You are <laughs> ah one new one, one new one. I think he's a confusing personality. That would be a good yes. <laughs> I agree. Uh, the confusing is uh, oh yes, you can see it. Uh, there are many many books written on Constantine and on and on and. Uh, you might have got in, in 2060, it was the 1700th anniversary of his becoming Augustus in 306 in York. Oh, there were so many books written, so many books on Constantine appeared in this year. I, I, I couldn't read all, it's impossible. Um, there were exhibitions and there, there are always produced new books. Why? Because of this confusing personality, or because he combined for the first time the, these Roman traditions now with a Christian interpretation of how to say it. No? And you can look on him from different angles, and there are historians who only see a Roman emperor and say, this Christianity is only a minor thing which is not important to understand, Constantine. I do not agree with that. <laughs> but there are others, they say, he is fully a Christian emperor, and we have no traces of paganism in him. The point is, really, that we have both. And this combination is so... Uh, powerful, or oh, there are so many things which do not really fit together if you have a closer look. And that's make, that makes him this confusing or complicated uh, Christ personality between paganism and Christianity. A uh, new question to this. But you said Constantine told Eusebius what to write down after his life. I guess it would be a good opportunity to attach the discovery to himself. You, I, I guess you mean the discovery of, of what? Ah, that, of the true cross. Yeah, maybe. Ah, maybe. That's an idea. Now the problem is, no, no, sorry, sorry. Constantine never came to Jerusalem or Bethlehem, as far as I know. Uh, his mother, Helena, went there. Uh, he never came to Alexandria. He, he went, he moved to the eastern part, to Nicomedia first. Uh, but as far as I know, he never went down there, so... Um, so maybe it's a matter of thinking more about it. Um, the problem with Constantine and Eusebius is <laughs> we know what Eusebius writes, what Constantine told him, but Eusebius set up his own image of Constantine. So he already molded it into a kind of what he viewed as Christian emperor. So the, there is a problem of the sources here that we only have uh, sources who present a specific picture. You mean Eusebius only wrote Constantine life without his mother? No, that's not what I mean. Um, I do not understand your question now, really. Um, without his mother. S sorry, I do not get the point of your question now. What, what I mean now is not related to Constantine and his mother, which is one story, but how Eusebius presents Constantine. And for Eusebius, Constantine was the ideal of a Christian emperor. And he presented him like this. Uh, what we do not have are 
uh, a kind of more neutral descriptions of Constantine and so on. So uh, it is like, who should we take? Yeah, we have, now we had, we have, we had elections in Germany now. Now the era of Angela Merkel is, is coming to an end. <laughs> if you only have official, uh, official statements of her and pictures, and then you, and that's what, only what we have, if you imagine this. And then you ask, what kind of person is she? You only have her political statements. You only have the images in newspapers and so on. And in a way, that's what we do with Constantine. Now, we only have a kind of official texts, like Eusebius texts. We have coins. We have these pictures. So we have, we have laws. And then we ask about the personality of Constantine. So that, that's the problem, why he is so elusive in a way and why it's so controversial. The only thing actually what we can describe is uh, the religious politician Constantine, a Roman emperor who obviously supported Christianity. That's what we have. The person behind is, is a mystery or remains the, long, the longer I think about him, the more mysterious it seems to me what he really thought. Uh, if you think about some not so nice traces in his life, he murdered all of his uh, relatives, uh, his son, and so on, uh, because he thought they are a danger for himself. That's not really a Christian habit to do that. Uh, uh, so the more you think about that, it becomes a mystery what was going on there. Okay, then. Fadi wants to say something. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Schurz. Interesting literature, yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So I thank you for that or hearing to this. Um, okay. I wish you all a very, very good time. This pandemia seems to come to an end now. I think I'm convinced it will end next year. <laughs> I yeah, even want to say spring next year, half a year, and, still, and then it's over. I... I think it's, and I hope for you, it's the same as for me, and I know it from Friday, that we can go back more and more to our no normal lives, yeah, that we can meet each other in a normal way and not hidden mm. behind mm. masks. We're very much glad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's coming more and more back to normal life. Uh, Fadi told me that the school moved to a new place now which is bigger and better than before yes. it was already nice before so it Thank must you. be great now <laughs> <laughs> uh, so all the best to all of you and That's maybe for another occasion we can meet it's again always a pleasure Dr. Fierce, to have you it's really a pleasure and we are honored to have you thank you so much for your time thank you for kind personality <laughs> thank you for spirit yeah thank you a lot <laughs>